Welcome back to the Prepare Like a Pro live chat show. My name is Jack McLean. I am the host, and today I am going to debrief last week's live interviews, announce the upcoming guests for Prepare Like a Pro episodes as well as our live chats, and update all things Prepare Like a Pro. We've actually got a couple of new segments, one being a Get Better Plan Wednesday podcast. So we now have three podcast recordings that drop every week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. And uh, there's also a new Instagram live segment, which I'm currently streaming from, where, g'day, Alex, um, we're going live on YouTube, but also where I'm going to be answering our Instagram followers' questions as well. So if you're tuning in on Instagram, guys, stay with me. I know I'm staring at the computer, but I'm going to answer the questions that you guys send through uh, in five minutes or so. So if you have any questions... Um, or if you're listening to this in podcast world and you've got some questions for us about Prepare Like a Pro or anything to do with your strength and conditioning, I'm more than happy to answer them. All you need to do is email us your question or direct message us and we'll note those questions down and answer them every Sunday at 6 p.m. live and then they will go into the podcast world every Monday. The podcast recording for these Sunday shows is uh, launched. So, that's a new segment as well as our Get Better plan. So really excited about those two new um, education streams, I guess, and, and ways to connect with our um, audience and community. In terms of last week's live chat, we had Deep, uh, Beatrice Devlin on the podcast. She is our Perth uh, strength and conditioning coach. So she's over in uh, West Side, which is good to have representation in Western Australia. I know there's athletes that have been following our program over the last year and a half, both online and on the individualised package. So uh, it's great to have representation over there and no doubt uh, Beatrice is going to do some amazing work with our athletes. Um, it was great to sh share her story Sorry, on our podcast. Um, she's got an amazing story on resilience, but back in um, when she played in junior days, it was actually banned for her to play at six years of age, even though all her mates were playing. Um, because she was female, she wasn't able to join in with her guy mates and play the football. So she had to um, play on, with her neighbours and play on the streets for a year and then lucky enough was able to play against the boys at, um, and uh, always talked about the, the um, sorry, talked about the constant challenge that a female footballer had back in um, her day where you're constantly judged on your gender rather than your performance. Uh, even though she was outperforming a lot of the guys, she was constantly judged by some parents and some players by simply her gender. Although the support from her teammates as well as her parents um, really helped her out to be able to focus on her goal and she had such a passion and still does for the, for the game. So she always talked about almost that growth mindset where it um, created a fire in her belly to prove them wrong that um, females can play the game. And this is all before it was professional as well. So um, no doubt Beatrice is inspiring a lot of young footballers um, today to um, stick at it if you're going through some challenges in parts of the country and it will pay dividends later on. Um, and she mentioned that the resilience that she uh, had helped her um, get over her injuries um, from those experiences. Um, and she's had two significant injuries, an ACL, which for those that aren't aware, that's a, at least a year long. Um, unfortunately, due to um, Beatrice's um, issue with the with the surgery, she had some blood clotting and bits and pieces. So she actually took 14 months before she returned to play. Uh, and... She was also delisted after her ACL, so that's uh, two really challenging, tough blows, particularly when it was her uh, favourite team that she was delisted by with the Fremantle Dockers. So, um, But great story nonetheless. She talked about how it, another another area where she focused on it, it made her better and, and it, it strengthened the fire in her belly to, to keep improving and focusing on the controllables and um, hence why she'd be such a great coach to work with, a uh, great mentor, um, she has the strength of empathy, being through a lot of the ups and downs of football, playing at the highest level and uh, working towards your goals and dreams and, and making them a reality, but also the challenges that come with that, with injuries and um, those critiquing you. So, yeah, super inspiring story. Make sure to check it out. And, um, yeah, it, it was one that 
um, you'll want to watch either on YouTube, if the whole episode is on our YouTube channel, or you can listen to the recording. We'll be launching the podcast next Tuesday. In terms of upcoming live interviews, we have Josh Groudon, the Kicking Dynamics on the podcast on Tuesday at, uh, sorry, Thursday at 8.30 p.m. Uh, Josh is the creator of the Kicking Dynamics. He's also the coach. Uh, he's got a great uh, story. We're really looking forward to sharing it, where he was uh, drafted the GWS Giants. He was there for three years, unfortunately broke his leg and worked out what he was going to do after being cut from the team. Uh, the squad, he decided to go to America where he got a scholarship as a punter, and he was there for five or so years, came back and is now helping footballers um, improve their kicking technique. He's studying and completing his high-performance manager uh, degree, uh, so he's doing, he'll be a master of strength and conditioning uh, in the near future, so he understands the physical preparation side. He's got a good understanding of the athletes' side of things, and now he's got a great coach's eye and ability to be able to help athletes with their uh, football kicking skills. So we've got him on next Thursday. Really looking forward to that chat. If you've got any questions for Josh, start noting them down or send them through to us, and we'll make sure to uh, get those questions in. G'day, footy lover. Thanks for tuning in, mate. Then we've also got... Tim Parham, which will be the following uh, Tuesday on the 16th. So pencil that one in at 8.30 as well. And we're looking at confirming a time with Matthew McGregor, who is the Hawthorne sports psychologist and currently working with the AFL Players Association as a sports psychologist. So really looking forward to those three chats. I'll confirm Tim's and Matthew's um, in the upcoming days when we know the confirmed time. But one that you can pencil in is Josh Groudon, which will be next Thursday, or this Thursday if you're listening in the podcast world. For next week's podcast, we have, as I mentioned, Beatrice Devlin on Tuesday, our Perth coach, and also we've got our second, which is a new segment, our second Get Better Plan podcast. So this is a new um, thing that we've just introduced. We've been doing a few presentations with our academy members as well as the athletes on our program and we're now going to share that content with the wider community of Propellic Pro. So for free, you'll be able to listen to 50%, so half of those presentations. Uh, obviously, academy members and athletes on our program will have access to the whole presentation, um, but to give people um, a bit of a, an idea and hopefully some learnings for free. We're going to open that up to the podcast community now. So on Wednesdays, there'll be a podcast that drops and it'll be around everything to do with the athlete side as well as the strength and conditioning side. So if you're developing strength and conditioning coach wanting to work in elite sport, the Wednesday podcast will be um, for you as well. And from the athlete's point of view, for footballers, we will have a uh, focus on your lifestyle, so how to improve your sleep, your mindset and your nutrition, recovery, um, as well as breaking down our philosophy with strength and conditioning side of things. So last week was our Fitness for Football Masterclass uh, presentation on all things football. We're going into great detail around the big topics, the big rocks when it comes to football physical preparation. This Wednesday is going to be specifically on our strength and conditioning philosophy. So if you're interested in knowing the why behind our program, and the way we do things at Prepare Like a Pro, and make sure to listen to this Wednesday's podcast. Um, and if you want the whole recording, you can purchase it from our website for $29, or you can become an Academy member where you get access to all our presentations, plus exclusive access to join me for the live interviews and ask the guest questions for as little as $20 a month. Or you can also have access to our presentations for $5 a month by becoming an Academy member. And then on Friday, we have Dr. Dominique Kondo coming on to the, or dropping on the podcast Friday's episode with Dom. She is a sports dietitian. She's recently just finished her work at Geelong Cats. Um, she's worked at universities and she's uh, got a wealth of experience helping athletes improve not only their health and performance, but also body composition goals like dropping body fat, increasing your muscle mass. Um, and how to have fuel for your training. So it was a, it was a um, massively informative um, episode, one that she provides the information and the research, but also more importantly, um, gives you the understanding of how to implement that 
into really easy to understand um, and breaks down the importance of um, nutrition when it comes to training for performance. So I really recommend if, if nutrition is an area that you feel you need to get better at or you're a practitioner and you want to get a better understanding of how you can help your athletes, maybe that you don't have a nutritionist or a sports dietitian at your club and you, you want to know of some sports dietitians that you can refer to, um, Dom talks about um, some ways that you can do that uh, and also some basic understanding with uh, nutrition and sports sports uh, fueling when it comes to improving what you eat and how that can make an impact on your performance but also if you're in rehab and how it can help your body recover. So definitely listen, recommend listening to this Friday. We're going to get into the questions now, guys. So if you're listening in from Instagram, I'm now going to face you guys and answer the questions that you've sent through which has been a fair few. So I'll start with Chanel's. What are some best tips or exercises to improve your long distance running in football? I, I mean, I like to keep it as simple as possible. And when it comes to running, the, the most important thing is to run regularly. So on our program, we'll run for the majority of the year, three times a week. For some that really need to improve their running, they might do four times a week. Or for some that um, may not be able to handle four times a week, they only run two times a week. So having an individualized program that suits your level of fitness and training age is really, really important because you're not going to improve your long distance running overnight. It's going to take time to build up your loads to be able to handle more volume and, and higher intensity sessions, which are going to uh, put a better, a greater stress on the body, which will improve the the output, the capacity that you can run for longer distances. So in short, following a program, following it consistently and doing a good job of listening to the program and trusting the process. Um, too often do we see with footballers they push themselves maximally every time they train and they run five times a week and they end up, you know, getting an overload type injury like shin splits or um, tight calves or sore lower back, whatever it might be, and then they have to take a month off running and then recondition again. So you end up getting this yo-yo response so consistency is key following a program that um, has been designed for you um, or at least is specific to your uh, sport and your age so you're able to handle the program recover well um, and get in a bulk of work over a period of time which is how you're going to improve your your fitness so great question Chanel I wouldn't I wouldn't complicate it with doing um, too many other things other than running consistently well at least three times a week have a program that you can follow and do your best at doing that program to the best of your ability. That would be the, the most important things and my best tips. From there, um, some extras that you can do to, to help your, your ability to adapt would be sleep. Make sure you're sleeping well so you recover. So getting in your eight hours of quality sleep. So trying to wind down at the end of the day and make sure that you're going to bed well rested um, and you're not alert and it takes you under 30 minutes to fall asleep and you're not you're not restless throughout the night you're waking all the you're waking, sleeping like a baby you're sleeping all the way through um, until the morning uh, and so you're feeling like you've got plenty of energy when you wake up and then from a nutrition point of view listen to the to the experts either have a sports dietitian that you work with to help your nutrition uh, hopefully your club has has one and reach out to them um, all the dietitians i've worked with are, are super uh, open and more than happy to help out any way they can. So reach out to your to nutritionist or your dietitian and um, make sure that you're eating um, in conjunction with your program. So typically they'll talk about like carbohydrate periodization and having a little bit more carbs on the day that you're, you're running and then looking after your carbs um, and reducing your carb intake on the days that you're, that you're um, not running that day. So you're looking after your body uh, and listening to your training program. So those lifestyle factors are really, really important. And, all, and also looking after your mental health because if you're super stressed, you're not going to be concentrating as well when you're, when you're running. So your running technique might be a little bit sloppy. You might not be breathing as well because, you're, because of your stress. So looking after your mental health and making sure that you're uh, being kind to yourself, you're not uh, having expectations that are possible to meet, but you're focusing on small goals along the way to get better with your long-distance running. So there's some big, some physical things, some lifestyle things, and hopefully that helps. Lucas, our academy members, sent through the next one. Tips to prepare for wet weather footy. Ooh, that's 
tough one. Uh, it's probably a little bit out of my forte. I, I, that'd be a better question for a football coach. Um, from a physical point of view, you'd want to make sure that you, you know, you, your skills. If the, those that are skillful and and, and good with, um, you know, land based training where they're where it's um, not wet, um, are probably going to better be able to handle because those foundations and those good habits and um, the the ability to handle the football is going to transfer to the wet weather footy as long as you're practicing wet weather footy. So when it is raining and you're getting, um, and that's an area maybe that you need to get better at, is simply just practicing training in, in wet weather. Uh, maybe you've avoided um, training when it rains or the team always goes in and does an indoor session where sometimes you need to actually prepare in those conditions because at the end of the day, football is a winter sport. Uh, depending on where you, you live in the country, you're probably going to play, you know, half half your games of the season with some sort of rain. So making sure you're exposing yourself to those conditions would be my recommendation. But the specific skills on how you should change your marking ability, how you should change your, your ground ball ability, your kicking technique and all that sort of thing, um, I would leave to the, the kicking experts and the, and the uh, technical coaches. When we did have Tim Schmidt on, though, from Kicking Dynamics, he talked about the foundations shouldn't change with your kicking technique, whether it be uh, whatever the weather conditions, the, uh, the the basics, the fundamentals should stay the same. So that was, um, I thought, a really sound tip. But, yeah, great question, Lucas. I don't think I helped you out, mate, but hopefully I did in some way. And then our next one's from Jack Lawrence. What's a good 2K time trial for under-16s? Um, it, it would depend largely on normally with my 2K time trial recommendations to athletes. It, it all depends on two things. If they're, if they're um, focusing on making a squad or, or getting drafted, then you do need to compare yourself to what your competition are doing. But if you're focusing on your development and being the, um, the best version of yourself over the long term, it's actually much better to just compare yourself to yourself. So, of course, there's going to be times where you're going to have to get a 2K time trial because a coach has told you you're competing potentially against another player and you've got to beat that player or, or the position average of our midfielders is, you know, seven minutes. So you need to get a seven-minute 2K to, to uh, make the team. Then you need to focus on those things. But... I would say largely when I'm working with athletes, I'd worry more about what did you get last time? Let's say it was eight minutes. Let's try and get to seven minutes 40 this preseason, you know, and they might get to seven minutes 40 in the pre-Christmas block, you know, from, from they started in the program in October and they got there in December. Okay, where, where do we need to go? Then? And if they feel like it's, their fitness is still leading them down to perform well in training and to recover well, um, we've, and we indicate there's an area, it's still an area that's letting them down, and then let's work towards 7.30, 7.20. And you're focusing on on your own um, performance and your own, you're not comparing yourself to others, but you're actually comparing yourself to yourself. And that's a really good habit to get into early. Um, it's a hard one because you are playing in a competitive sport where it's easy to compare yourself to others, um, and particularly when the environment is competitive. If you're pushing to get into a squad, it's only natural to look at those things of what other people are getting with their 2K time trial. Uh, but ultimately, as long as you're improving your 2K time trial to where you were in the last preseason or the last time you returned after Christmas, then you're heading in the right, um, you're heading in the right place. So that's the main thing. Focus on where you are today and where you want to go in a month's time or two months' time, three months' time. What do you want to get out of this summer with your 2K time trial? And ultimately, the 2K time trial as well. It's something that you don't want to stress too much about. Uh, ultimately. Once you get it to a point where it's at a good level, um, which for midfielders will be under 7 minutes 30, for key position players around 7 minutes 45. Um, so as long as you get it to that point, you'd focus more on um, your high-intensity repeat efforts, your strength, so you're able to um, keep your feet in the contest, stick your tackles. Um, so from a physical point of view, there's a lot more important things than just your 2K time trial. Uh, and you don't want you, the focus of your 2K time trial to be a detriment to your strength training, your power training, and your speed training because all those things are really, really important. Uh, and sometimes that can happen, especially at a young age. You, you feel like the 2K time trial is everything. 
because that's where you're being judged. But there's a lot of other factors that are really, really important that are going to help your performance with your football. Hopefully that helps, Jack. Great question, mate. We'll go for two more questions and then we better get back into the uh, podcast episode. So we've got Lucas here. How should I recover after a session? This is very individual when it comes to recovery. Uh, the science is... Um, it changes a lot when it comes to recovery in athletic performance. So I would usually recommend to athletes to try things out, particularly in the off-season, pre-season. You know, after a big contested session where you did some combat, some wrestling, and it was like the main session of the week with your football club, try um, different types of recovery sessions. So an ice bath might be good after that type of session because of the uh, the bruising and the inflammation created from the crash and bash. Uh, and then... You try the ice bath, see how you feel the next day. If you feel a lot better uh, and you feel you're, you're, then you recovered a lot better before the next session, then that's a good thing to note down when you have a, a, a contested wet weather footy game in season. Ice bath might be a good strategy for you and that's where you lean on it. Um, one thing to also recognise with ice bath is it does uh, affect the body's ability to recover from the training. So there's a lot of Olympic athletes and a lot of high-performance athletes that are focusing on improving their physical capacities over a long period of time because they want to peak for an event. And they typically won't be doing a lot of ice baths because it actually affects the body's ability to adapt from the training. Yeah, so it almost think of it like you're um, losing your progress. You're not getting the same amount of adaptation from your training from the weight session that you did, from the conditioning session that you did. Where, whereas if you didn't have the ice bath, you're gonna, your body's going to... Um, respond to that information so sometimes information like after a game when you want to and the goal is to recover optimally for the next week ice bath can be helpful to get the information down but if we're focusing in your pre-season off-season where we want to get in a lot of training and we that information is a good thing because your body's going to adapt to it to get stronger then maybe you don't want to do an ice bath because it's going to affect your improvement in your physical capacities like getting fitter and faster Okay, so that's important to, to think about when it comes to ice baths. Um, time it. If you're in season, you're in finals, ice baths may be a good thing if they help you recover and you help you feel good. Or if you're focusing on improving your physical capacities and you're in a training phase, maybe focus on massage or other areas that aren't going to uh, affect you, the training stimulus. Uh, other forms of recovery can be movement-based. That, that's a great way to um, work on your mobility. So doing Pilates, doing yoga, um, doing any sort of active range of motion where you feel better leaving the session than when you started. Uh, you didn't, um, you know, you didn't exhaust yourself. Obviously, when we're recovering, we don't we want minimal fatigue. Um, so a feel-good manager is what we talk about at Pelic Pro, where you want to feel good throughout the whole session and you should leave the session if it's a recovery-focused session with more energy than when you left. So things like stretching, foam rolling, mobility, uh, light, activation-based drills over the mini bands. These are some great recovery techniques. Great question though, Lucas. All right, so we're going to now go off. A few of you sent through your questions through direct message. So I'll answer those questions and then we'll wrap up this week's podcast. So um, Wal has written in, I've been invited to Casey VFL preseason, so I'm still wondering if the workload will be okay between the VFL preseason and your online strength conditioning program good question well um yes it will our most of our athletes are in a some form of football program whether they're playing community level nav league vfl um, or state league football um, so the, the program does uh periodize to when you when you go back to football training the loads in the hamstrings and the groins go down to accommodate the workload that you're getting getting back into skills uh, and then conversely when you're out of football training mode the loads on the hamstrings and the groins pick up because we want to keep those areas strong and resilient. So the program does periodize to whether you're in training or out of training and um, we change the program and the running program to suit. So Lars Finson has written, I've been doing weights for a year now and I've stayed the same height since I started. Should I be concerned? No, Lars, I wouldn't be concerned um, unless you're doing uh heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps of training you're absolutely exhausting exhausting yourself you're not sleeping well 
um, and your body's super overworked, physical training is stress. So if you're mentally stressed and you're doing heaps and heaps of training, I'm talking over 20 hours a week, plus you're not eating the right foods um, and you're not sleeping well, maybe then that would affect your growth. But typically the body is going to grow regardless. You'd have to put an extreme amount of stress on the body to affect it. Um, the only sports that spring to mind for me, and the, and the research is is quite wish-washy, but in, in the general consensus, if you're doing weight training properly with good technique and it's uh, progressively overloaded um, in a safe manner, um, uh, you should feel confident that you, it's not going to affect your height. You, you, you're growing in, in height. Um, however, if you're um, doing a hell of a lot of training, your body's in an under-recovered state, then a lot of things can happen that can negatively affect your health and potentially maybe height could be a, an effect of that. Um, but in general, I would say I wouldn't be concerned. Um, is, uh, yeah, it would, wouldn't be a, a major factor. Uh, however, definitely seek an expert's advice and um, speak to your local sports doc if you can, and this, just to have clarity of mind to make sure that everything you're doing is allowing you to grow to your genetic potential. Clancy Mills, I want to increase my speed. What are some key tips? Like the long distance question that I answered before, we want to keep it as simple and specific as possible. So to improve your speed, I'm assuming you're talking about like your running speed. We want to make sure we're sprinting regularly. So in our program, we, we commonly sprint at least once a week in the off season, pre season. Um, so we want to make sure you're working up to 90% of your max velocity, which is your peak speed. So think of like a, a 60 meter effort, you might take 20 meters to build up to that high speed effort. And then you might hold it for a few meters and then wind down. So you've got a 20 minute window to hit that high speed effort. As soon as you hit it, let's say 90% of your max speed. So if you can sprint, you know, for simple say, let's say you can sprint 10 meters per second, you get up to nine meters per second, then you start to wind down for the remaining of the 60. That's a good way to expose you to high speed running. Um, and like anything, if you want to improve on it, you've got to get the reps in. So that consistency of at least once a week, working up to some high speed efforts is the best way to improve your speed. Good question, Clancy. Jeremy Gorski, what is your podcast about? Our podcast is all things physical preparation for uh, football. So the Australian rules football, that is. So we interview uh, AFL coaches, um, we interview sports psychologists that have worked in AFL, uh, sports dietitians, strength coaches, conditioning coaches, as well as because I'm a strength and conditioning coach and we have a lot of strength and conditioning coaches listening to the podcast, we will um, interview researchers and those that work in high performance sport. Um, so a lot of strength and conditioning coaches that may have not worked in AFL, but they have worked in the industry of high-performance sports. So that's a bit of a taste of what our podcast is about. Harry, um, Harry, a post, what do you guys do? Like is it more fitness or do you do ball skills? We're, no, prepare like a pro, we're completely the physical training point of view. So that's our area of focus. All our coaches are quali degree qualified to focus on your training in the gym, on the field, as well as uh, your recovery. So we can give you advice around nutrition, sleep, uh, and, and your recovery, both mental and physical. Uh, and then we generally refer when it comes to injuries. However, we do have a physio that works with us, Nalesh Murdy. He's one of our coaches. So if one of our athletes is injured, uh, he would look after the uh, rehabilitation side of things, especially acute stage. And then Strength and conditioning coaches typically will look after the more return to performance, which is the later stage rehab. So that's the that's the common stuff that we do. We don't do any ball skills. We leave that to the technical coaches. Final question, guys. These have been really, really good. Luke Jarvis, I'm a year 12 student in New South Wales wanting to work in elite sport. What steps did you take and what smaller jobs and qualifications did you take along the way? Great question, Luke, and awesome to uh, hear you're passionate about the industry and you, you already know what you want to do at year 12. That's amazing, mate. It took me a few years before I found my um, passion of elite sport. I, I worked as a personal trainer for a good six years, which I absolutely loved, helping people uh, improve their health and, and general well-being. Um, and then I worked at a local football club, a club that I play for, Corfield Grammarians, and looked after their pre-season. 
and absolutely loved the experience and was lucky enough to meet Wayne Oswald, who was the head coach there, and he got me in contact with the strength and conditioning staff at North Melbourne Football Club. And I just simply asked, what do I need to do to have a job like theirs? Because it looked pretty cool after spending the day there. And, and they mentioned that you, you need to get your um, Bachelor of Sports Science. So um, that's what I did. I went to Victoria University, um, did my Bachelor of Sports Science. I was also doing a fair bit of CrossFit training at the time to learn Olympic weightlifting and gymnastics, which were things I never did as a kid. I just played typical Melbourne kid, played Mel, uh, cricket and football. So I found as a coach exposed me as well as it just um, I wasn't playing any sports at that time. So to uh, get the competitive uh, itch, I guess, um, was it scratch the itch, so to speak, I found CrossFit was quite a good community to be involved in and it helped me learn um, some good tools to have as a coach now working in the performance space, which are Olympic lifting and body weight movements like on the rings, ring dips and um, and different types of pull-up variations and core work. So uh, while doing my degree, I uh, finished up working at Corfu Grammarians after I got an opportunity at Box Hill Hawks, and I volunteered there for half a year and was lucky enough to um, get a small paid role, like an honorarium, the following year. And then every year that I was there, the person in front of me had moved on to another opportunity, which which left the door open for me to progress. So um, I pretty much did my apprenticeship at Box Hill. And then when I finished my degree, it was lucky timing that Sean Dempster was working at Hawthorne at the time and decided to spend more family time and move from the full-time role because it was so demanding, working at Hawthorne during the day and then Box Hill at night. And that left um, a good opportunity for me to take on that full-time role at, at Hawthorne uh, for a couple of years. So that they were my um, ways that I got there, mate. So I couldn't recommend any higher to get experience um, definitely uh, helped me so get experience in the sport whatever elite sport you want to work in start uh, at any level whether it be juniors community level whatever it is start there and then try and work your way up into a state league program or a development program like the NAB league and get experience there and then if you can intern I was lucky enough in my final year of uni to intern Hawthorne where I spent uh, three days a week there um, while doing my degree in my final year um, if you can yeah, get a foot in the door at an AFL club, maybe do an honours or something like that. Um, some, a lot of people are doing PhDs these days at, at clubs and getting some experience that way as well as a foot in the door and then you start to learn and see the environment and you can um, you might get an opportunity at that club or you might get an opportunity at another club. Um, but, yeah, it ta- does take a fair bit of assistance. Make sure that you, if, if it is something you really want that you stick at it um, and ride the, ride the waves of the ups and downs. Um, having a career or a financial security outside of sport is also important. So make sure you've, you've got personal training or you've got something that you can um, pay ends meet while you're working your way up the sport ladder because uh, it does take time. So, so to take that pressure off yourself financially, make sure you've got some other income and revenue. Um, but, yeah, the other qualifications that help me are Australian Strength and Conditioning Association. So I actually just did my Level 3 recently, so the Level one and two I found massively helpful. Um, I've done the Australian Federation Weightlifting Level 1 course, pretty keen to do Level 2. Um, Paul Check's Holistic Lifestyle Coaching course I found was helpful just from a general philosophy point of view. Uh, your Skin Caliper course. They're the ones that spring to my mind as the, as the main ones. But, yeah, doing your degree and getting experience would probably be the the main two. All right, last one, Samo, only because I know you've been following us for a while. What university degree did you study in? Uh, I went to Victoria University in Footscray, the sports exercise science degree there. Great uni in Melbourne, Footscray. All right, guys, so we'll move, we'll start. To, that's the Q&A for this week. So I'm going to do this every week now. So if you're listening either live or in the podcast world, and you have a question for us, um, uh, feel free to send it through to us via email or on our Instagram, and we'll note it down, and I'll answer those questions 6 p.m. live every week on our YouTube and Instagram. I've talked about the upcoming guests. So we've got Beatrice on Tuesday, our uh, strength and conditioning philosophy on Wednesday, and then Dom Kondo, the sports dietitian, who's just recently fished up to Long Cats on Friday. Um, at Prepare Like a Pro, where uh, we've just committed to Glen Orkey Football Club, looking after their senior women's team. That's in a state league program in Tasmania. So super honoured to 
work with uh, the program there. I worked with Aaron Cornelius, the head coach at Box Hill Hawks, and um, yeah, really looking forward to a season with them. And then I'm actually coming back, as I talked about before, my first opportunity experience in working in football was at Coffield Grammarians. I'm uh, now back at the club uh, working in a, a programming role and uh, I've got um, both a, a intern in at the men's program, Nicholas Rule, um, and uh, we're looking for a women's program. So if uh, we're looking for a, a someone to look after the strength conditioning for the female program. So if you're out there listening to this and you know someone who wants to get some strength conditioning experience, we've got Tom Cleary at Glen Orkey Men's. He's looking after the men's program. We've got Nicholas Rule looking after uh, the Corfield Marines men's program, but we're looking for two strength conditioning coaches that are degree qualified and have a passion for football to look after our senior women's program for those two clubs, Glen Orkey and Corfield Marines. So if you are interested or you know someone, email us at jack at preparelikeapro.com and uh, send through your CV and we will um, get in contact and see if you'd be a good fit. That's basically it, guys. Our power tip for this week is um, for your speed and power training. I posted a couple of reels on Instagram and YouTube shorts about um, how to improve your power in the gym. Um, You would have seen some different types of training there, a static jump with the trap bar, um, a static uh, counter movement jump on the box with the box jumps and then some counter movement jumps with the broad jumps. So really important when it comes to power training that you, you're training with external load like light weights and, and the research shows you want to try and move to get a power stimulus at least one meter per second to get that effect. If you're moving slower than that, you're more training towards max strength or speed strength. So to get true power, try and move a meter per second. There's a lot of apps out and out there, like Iron Path's a good example um, of an app that you can download that tracks the speed of the barbell. Um, rest periods are really, really important. So make sure when in down, you're noticing the bar speed is, is getting a little bit slower on the app or just by feel, make sure you rest a little bit longer before your next rep or set because rest periods allow intensity, allows the nervous system to recover. So you're able to recruit all those muscles uh, at a fast, fast pace. Um, and then the other thing to understand is understand your peak range of motion and a strategy that suits you to generate force quickly. Um, so for some, if you're more an elastic based athlete, you'll um, have a short range of motion uh, and it'll be quite a rapid movement for you to generate your peak power. And then for others, for more your stronger based athletes, uh, um, you will need to go through deeper ranges of motion. So if you're doing counter movement jump, you might squat a little bit lower. Where an elastic based athlete, they might only squat, um, you know, three quarters height, and then they're they're getting right up. Okay, so you understand the type of athlete you are. Are you more a strength based athlete, or are you more a speed based athlete? Your springs, okay. And then on that, with the springs analogy, that's how the stretch shortening cycle works. So that's why you can jump a lot higher when you stretch the quads on the way down of a squat and then rebound out of it straight up high, you'll jump a lot higher than when you um, squat down, hold for three seconds. So you're holding the stretch isometrically and then jump. Yeah, there'll be a significant um, reduction in your performance. So if you want to go for peak velocity, peak power, do use the stretch sorting cycle and that's how most actions on the sporting field will be done. Uh, there will be a few opportunities though in the footy field where you'll need power, like in a jostling contested situation, and you might be holding a, a partial squat isometrically, and you need to use your upper body strength and your leg core strength. Um, but for the most part, when you're accelerating, decelerating, change of direction, it's all in one motion. So train that way. So that's the power tip for this week. And um, yeah, you make sure to if you've got any questions or if you want to your questions answered for the upcoming week to send them through to us on Instagram or email us at jack at preparelikepro.com. We've also got a free 14-day trial, guys. So if you're interested in trialing out our online program, head to our website. All you need to do is fill in your email address to join our newsletter where we send a lot of exclusive blog posts and videos um, and that will activate a free 14-day trial. Thanks for tuning in, guys, and I'll see you on the next episode.